Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to uh, part two of our uh, amp building extravaganza in which we were building from scratch a replacement amplifier uh, and acquiring a brand new speaker to restore this previously empty Valco Supro cabinet to full operating capability. In chapter one I left you hanging about where the output transformer will, will be uh, installed and uh, also the filter capacitors because there's just not a whole lot of room underneath here to do that. So let me show you uh, right away what I've come up with as a solution. Now here's the plan. I'm going to use a 1 8 inch thick sheet of aluminum to mount the output transformer with all five of its leads going through grommets and I have riveted two uh, long terminal strips here so I can construct the entire power rail with the three electrolytics and the internodal resistors and then it will communicate with the rest of the amp through this grommeted hole and then through these holes at the top it will be secured to the upper rear vertical panel of the uh, chassis so it will then protrude down like this I'll show you after I've connected it uh, you'll get a better uh, look at it but it's going to be connected right here and come down to where it touches the floor of the cabinet just like the uh, control panel does and um, I've checked and it has plenty of clearance between this and the speaker so uh, there should be no problem it'll be completely hidden it'll still have some ventilation and uh, it also provides uh, one layer of shielding between the power supply and the circuit of the amp. Here you see how it will be mounted to that vertical uh, rear panel and align with the floor of the uh, amplifier cabinet. Okay, I'm going to use screws to connect this plate to the chassis because I will want to have the room to be able to install and wire the tube bases before I screw in the power supply and make my connections. Here as you can see there's plenty of room for the output transformer right here and the power rail will be vertically down here with all kinds of airspace around it. Uh, I've also drilled four holes for uh, screws to secure the chassis to the wood supports in the cabinet. Next I'm going to rivet in terminal strips uh, near my tubes and jacks and other components so that I'll have places to make uh, connections for each of the tubes to the rest of the circuit and uh, the terminal strips will stabilize those connections. I'll also put one here horizontally right below where the tremolo circuit is to uh, give myself uh, plenty of um, lugs here uh, to uh, support the tremolo circuit. Now the reason for doing all of this now is I intend to paint the chassis, the outer surface of the chassis. I'm going to use a base coat, clear coat. Uh, right now it's going to be gold to, so it will go well with the kind of golden tweed of the cabinet. Um, and I don't want to be drilling a bunch of holes or manhandling the chassis after it's painted. I would rather just be able to flip it over and solder my connections and do my construction in here without having to punch holes or do anything else uh, that might disrupt the paint. Okay, so now it's time to uh, rivet in the terminal strips and then I think uh, we should be ready to uh, start painting the chassis. I believe that all the necessary terminal strips have been riveted in in appropriate places uh, to allow for the circuit to be fully supported as it connects the different components. Now since uh, I'm going to rivet in the three large octal tube sockets 
uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and rivet them in before I paint the chassis uh, because riveting afterwards uh, the rivets will be real bright shiny silver uh, they'll stick out they won't look right and also I might damage the paint uh, as I'm using that uh, the rivet pliers uh, to pull the pop rivets through so let's do that and then I think we're ready to paint and just to make things a little simpler uh, before I rivet the socket in place I have masked the micarta portion of it uh, it's a lot easier to mask it uh, unriveted than after it's unriveted into the chassis the sockets are all riveted in place and I have masked all the holes so that as I'm spraying the outer surface we don't get overspray on our components inside for a cheesy and amateurish look um, I'm going to have to install the 12AX7 sockets with a little probably number four uh, nuts and bolts because the uh, clearance is just not there for the riveting gun and um, there's no other way to do it so I'll just install them after the painting is done now the one uh, final step before the spraying begins uh, is to cleanse the surface with some really stout degreaser uh, like either lacquer thinner or 409 uh, Windex something like that to be sure there's no big fingerprints right here to ruin the paint job I personally think this final uh, cleanup prep may be the most important step in the paint job if you thought this looked really clean and shiny look at what came off of it that was the first cleanup attempt okay so now I'm going to uh, go with the clean portion of my uh, towel here and go over it a couple more times until I don't see this type of mess okay there's cleanup number one cleanup number two you see we're kind of headed in the right direction I think one more just to be sure and you really don't need this type of garbage between your paint and your surface so one last uh, cleanup I'm going to use Windex for the final and then we're ready to start spraying there's the final cleanup and uh, now I'll just uh, blow it off with compressed air get any lint off and uh, I'll see you in just a couple minutes uh, with the painted chassis. Here is the painted chassis after a couple coats of a lacquer base coat gold. Uh, lacquer hardens uh, or dries very quickly, uh, but still I'm going to give it about an hour. Uh, you notice that it has no sheen. It's flat, which will allow the uh, clear to adhere. Uh, very well. Also the type of clear I'm using is automotive grade clear. It's very expensive. I think it's it's probably like sixty dollars a pint. Okay, I still I have some left over so I'm going to use it and uh, we should end up with a really pretty glossy finish. But uh, like I said, let's let this dry for about an hour before we do that. For those who are curious about the brand of automotive clear I used, uh, this is the brand and those are the ID numbers. This is the hardener and it is a urethane uh, clear. Uh, you might be able to get it locally if you want to give it a try, but I warn you it's pretty darn expensive. Here it is freshly sprayed. As you can see it's just about like glass. Uh, I'm spraying outdoors so there will be some dust particles but for now I'm very pleased with this I let the chassis air dry outside and it's oh, about 90 percent uh, hardened now uh, really urethane paint doesn't dry it's a chemical reaction but uh, it's not perfect any outdoor paint job especially a glossy one is going to have some dust particles 
but uh, I can clean those up and the reason I wanted a really nice shiny finish is that um, the, I'm going to use laser printed decals to label all of the controls and they adhere best to a really smooth glossy finish so that's what they're going to get okay so now I'm just going to leave this turn out the lights and run out the door before I drop something on it and we'll pick up tomorrow uh, with the assembly of our chassis Now that we have a nice smooth glossy finish for our chassis, it's time to label all of the controls, tube sockets, and uh, other parts of our amplifier chassis. And to do this, I have uh, decided to use uh, water transfer decals that are laser printed on special decal paper. Step one was to come up with a uh, proper um, font, size, boldness, everything else that, that suits the eye and then I actually spaced out the volume, tone, intensity and speed so that it will match the pot so I can up, uh, apply this particular decal all as one continuous strip that way they'll all be at the same height uh, the next step was after I came up with what I thought was an acceptable uh, set of labels is to print it uh, with my laser printer on the special decal paper. Now according to the directions, if you use a laser printer, you don't have to apply a fixative over the uh, printing. But if you use uh, an inkjet, you have to use like a clear uh, fixative to seal in and protect the ink because uh, we're going to cut these out soak them in water and then hopefully they will slide off of the paper and slide on to our chassis and then uh, when they dry they will be firmly attached At, uh, after they've completely dried then I'll have to clear coat the chassis again to seal in and protect the decals I did some more reading about decals and it turns out that like anything else uh, they like to have just a tiny bit of tooth or surface uh, imperfection to uh, adhere tightly so I lightly uh, wet sanded the entire chassis with 3000 grit sandpaper to give uh, as smooth a finish as I can that still offers a little bit of grip well, I'm installing the decals, and I'm telling you, this is not a task for the faint of heart. The membrane that the decal is on is about one angstrom thick. It has no uh, structural uh, integrity whatsoever. Um, you can wad it up if you try to push. So the best bet is to lay the piece of paper, the wet paper that the decal is on, right beside where you want it to go dampen the area where it's going to go and then slide it into place and blot very carefully around it. Okay, so let me continue now. Keep your fingers crossed. I'm going to try to apply one of these uh, holding the camera in one hand and applying in the other. Um, I found that if you cut the corners it helps because the corners want to fold over. So trimming them will make it a little easier. Now I'm going to drop this uh, 
printed side down into the water uh, bowl and take a droplet of water and dampen this area right here which is where the decal is going to end up. Okay I've set the decal paper down and I'm going to slide one handed this is an absolute nightmare. Well, I had to set the camera down for a second. What, what happened is I slid the membrane off, then positioned it in that damp area right above where the jack is going to go. Uh, now we'll let it dry and hopefully adhere. I'm getting a little braver on the application of these decals. And um, I put on the uh, logo, uh, which is larger. And maybe the larger the decal, the easier it is to apply. But uh, there it is for all to see. And I hope you get a kick out of the name. Now we'll stand it up and work on the uh, control panel. There's the control panel all finished. Um, that long decal stretched a little bit. Uh, so the intensity and tone are slightly off-center. Um, on the uh, cathode bypass cap and the NFB, the central position of the switch will be on in both cases. And then you can go up or down to turn uh, them off. Okay, and then my patented on, not on for the power uh, toggle. After waiting for the decals to dry thoroughly, I brought the chassis outside and sprayed uh, a couple coats of clear over the decals to seal them. Now, that kind of mixed results. The not on and the on look great. The two amp, you can't hardly see that membrane of the decal, but then you look at tremolo and it looks sort of milky around it. Um, apparently, it, it I guess after you've done this a while you get the feel for it. Look at that on. Shows a little bit of the milky perimeter. Here it doesn't. Kind of annoying but I think once it hardens completely uh, and I get all the controls and everything else in here it's going to look uh, really nice. Okay, the Thank heavens the ID tag back here came out just great. Well, the paint job is finished on the chassis, and uh, you know, I forgot to put a hole right here for the power cord, so I'm going to have to do what I swore I wouldn't, which is drill through the painted surface. At least there's a grommet around the outside to kind of hide it if there's any chipping. I thought about just running the cord over and back, but you know, it can get against tubes and, and the insulation get overheated and all. It's just better to have it come here. It's just simpler. So uh, that's the next step. I removed all the tape and then cleaned up the uh, inner perimeter of each of the holes uh, to clean out the paint residue and clear coat. And uh, now I think we're ready to start uh, mounting all the components on the chassis and then we'll be ready to start wiring. exactly stock but uh, let's give it a look over okay we'll go all the way around it and check out the engine which is the best part okay so grab a beer here we go you see the front end with the mighty rambler emblem proudly emblazoned nice looking wheels Great looking exhaust. It's really like a pro street modification. Just nice as can be. Tiny little car. These have really gotten to be popular with the pro street crowd because they're so compact and they really lend themselves to this type of modification. All aluminum. Blanc NTS LS3 Corvette engine. Actually, this one came from Escalade. Okay, the injectors have been uh, increased in diameter and the cam has been changed. So we're probably looking at close to 500 horsepower. Um, I think it's like 373 gears. You see, it barely fits. shoehorned in here, but very nice and done, very neat, you almost think that it came this way, okay, we all know better. Okay, 
we're on our ride. I'm firmly strapped in here. Captain Harry at the controls. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a school zone, so we slowed down to 88. But uh, I'll tell you, it rides firm, but very nicely. It sounds great. Not too noisy. Okay, let's uh, just do a little mild spurt of acceleration here. You ready, Doug? I'm I'm braced. <laughs> The space shuttle crew must feel like on the launch. Jeez. Just launch. Pass this truck. Let's try just another little burst of speed because one is never enough. fastest cars I've ever ridden. Incredible. But, but completely controllable. Thank God for the good brakes, too. Oh, yeah. I'll get some shots uh, from underneath. They're going to clean it up, uh, put it up on the rack and clean it up. But the, the engineering and all and the suspension and frame is just absolutely fabulous. So uh, that'll be maybe for another feature, feature in the future, which is not easy to say. But uh, no matter what, I don't can't get used to that. <laughs> to be honest, the part that I enjoy the most is the wiring, but you have to go through all of these preliminary steps to ever get to that point and uh, the closer I get the more excited I become so let's go ahead now and install all of the components tube bases jacks pots everything else that we need um, into our chassis so that then we can flip this over and start connecting them together to form the circuit because there's no rivet room on the 12 AX7 sockets I'm going to use some number four screws and nuts and because as always I never have short screws when I need them I only have like seven inch long ones so I um, had to cut uh, four of these down these much longer ones down clean up the ends uh, with and make sure the threads are uh, acceptable and then we'll use these abbreviated number four screws to install our tube sockets the 12AX7 uh, two bases have been installed. I aligned the slots in the screw head and made sure that the gap in pins uh, both on both uh, two bases faced outward. And just to make sure they stay put, I'm going to put a, a little droplet of super glue on each of the uh, exposed tips of the screw to uh, eliminate any chance of the nut coming loose. Now it's time to install the tremolo foot switch and 8 ohm speaker output. The tremolo foot switch can be just a simple one contact jack because it uh, can provide either ground or no ground for the tremolo circuit. The speaker output jack though is going to have two contacts and I'm going to wire the socket so that if nothing is plugged in and the main uh, signal contact is closed with the uh, generally grounding contract instead of being ground it's going to be an 8 ohm 10 watt ballast resistor to protect the circuit in case the uh, speaker um, jack gets pulled out or the uh, amp gets fired up without the speaker being connected. The two jacks are installed and we'll go into how to wire uh, the speaker output uh, with the 8 ohm 10 watt resistor uh, later when we are wiring the circuit. Now it's time to install all of the components on the control panel. 
the two instrument input jacks have been installed as well as the volume pot and the tone pot both of these are one meg audio taper now it's for the tremolo controls here's the tremolo intensity pot 250k linear taper the uh, tremolo speed pot the kind of an oddball 3 meg reverse audio taper uh, here is the switch for the NFB loop on off and this will be the cathode bypass cap on off well the mighty Princeton chassis is assembled with all the components in place except for uh, the panel at the rear which will have the uh, power supply rail and the output transformer like I said I'm going to wait on that until after I wire the tube so that I have plenty of room to do so and here is the front of the control panel I couldn't find a small washer uh, so I had to use a, a larger one and I don't know if I might get used to this if I don't I'll have to hunt down a smaller washer but for now this is the way it's going to look uh, from the rear of the cabinet and here is the inside of the chassis as you can see what started out as a fairly simple project suddenly looks pretty complex doesn't it and once all the wiring is in place it's going to look a whole lot more complex but for now uh, I hope you can see the kind of balance and spacing and organization of the components so that you have room to run your leads and uh, you have plenty of terminal strips near where they're going to be uh, needed so uh, with that in mind uh, I think it's time that we get started wiring but before we do start wiring I think we need to have a brief conversation about a topic called electrolysis uh, and that becomes an issue when you use an aluminum chassis now no doubt there will be some comments that will address this and uh, to try to forestall those comments let me address them uh, right here and now electrolysis occurs when a highly reactive metal like aluminum comes in direct contact with a much less reactive metal like steel in the presence of an electrolyte which includes salt acid and water when this happens you produce a galvanic response and the two metals with the electrolyte actually become a weak battery producing voltage and current now the steel in this uh, case uh, is the cathode and the aluminum is the anode now this corresponds to our vacuum tubes in which uh, we have the cathode at the bottom of the tube and the anode is the plate we know that electrons flow from the cathode to the anode and in so doing the aluminum the more reactive of the two metals will become uh, corroded and uh, eroded I should also add and it's confusing and I think silly but um, the conventional uh, theory about current flow is it always flows from plus to minus so I've included the current flow here if you read about electrolysis you'll see that they will uh, say that the current flows from the aluminum to the steel but we know that electrons are the only uh, subatomic particle that can actually move so we know as far as on electron uh, theory based uh, evaluation that the electrons are f actually flowing from the cathode to the anode just like they do in our vacuum tube amplifiers now why is this an issue well in this case I've used an aluminum chassis and there are steel components attached to it now on the surface you might say well uh, the aluminum might corrode like over a period of 50 years in the presence of a, a sea breeze which has plenty of water and salt we might have some degradation of the aluminum itself but that's really not what we're worried about what we're worried about is if we make ground connections using steel uh, screws bolts and things like that to connect 
ground wires to aluminum in the chassis, the corrosion will interfere with the electrical connection over time and our amplifier circuit will cease to have ground and will cease to function. Now how do I plan to counteract this electrolytic destruction of our amplifier circuit? Well there's several different approaches and I'm going to take a couple of them. Number one uh, there are metals besides steel that do not have a galvanic response with aluminum. Number one is stainless steel and number two is zinc. So if you have a uh, metal in contact with aluminum that is either stainless steel or zinc or zinc coated, the uh, electrolysis will not take place. Therefore in every case where I'm using uh, any type of hardware fastener, I make sure that they are either stainless steel or zinc plated. That will eliminate the electrolysis. Number two is it's standard practice in amplifier circuitry to use the chassis of the uh, amp as part of the circuit. Now how do we do that? Well wherever we have a signal or high voltage ground, we simply connect the wire to the chassis and then let the uh, current flow through the chassis to the center tap of the high voltage winding where it is returned to the circuit. In other words, the chassis represented by my hand is the missing part of the circuit between each of these grounds and the center tap of the high voltage winding. Now what if instead of grounding to the chassis each of these grounds were run directly back through a wire not through the chassis to that center tap. In that case you would uh, bypass any chance of electrolysis between dissimilar metals and uh, have a circuit then essentially that was bulletproof invulnerable to the evil forces of electrolysis. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm also curious to see how it works from a hum standpoint. Uh, if we even get greater hum reduction or if it causes background noise. I've never done this before. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think that the zinc plated hardware would uh, eliminate the problem. But just uh, sort of for exper or experimental uh, sake here, I'm going to uh, use uh, the, a non-chassis grounding method. That said, let's get started. Step one, let's wire up the primary circuit by which the AC comes through our three wire power cord and will energize the primary winding of the power transformer. We will have a, what, a black hot wire that comes in, a white return wire, and a green chassis grounding wire. The primary circuit is wired. I twisted the primary wires because they're going to carry AC and ran them back here where they're uh, only near the rectifier tube and which they will not present any sort of uh, hum issue. I ran uh, the wires through a couple conduits that are super glued to the chassis. Uh, as um, many of the viewers know I prefer to run the black wire, the hot wire coming in from the power cord to the switch first, then to the fuse, and then into the uh, one of the primary windings of the power transformer. The white wire, which is the return, goes to this lug and goes to the other primary wire. The green chassis ground comes down here, goes through the conduit, and is securely bolted with zinc plated hardware over here to one of the transform, uh, transformer bolts. Now that our primary circuit is wired, 
Uh, let's start uh, with our rectifier wiring and this is the filament wiring which are pins 2 and 8. Now you need to check your uh, color code on your transformer but it's almost always the yellow wires that are the 5 volt leads. So uh, you twist them so that they'll neutralize each other's uh, electromagnetic fields and then uh, solder them to pin 2 and pin 8. Now you start, see where the slot is down there that locates the tube. The first pin clockwise from there looking at the bottom of the tube socket is pin 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So our filament winding uh, for our rectifier is now completed. And when we mount that rear panel that has the uh, power supply rail, we're going to run our B-plus from pin 2 right here. We'll go through the grommet and then we'll go to our electrolytic uh, filter caps, which will be on that plate once it's installed. Now it's time to wire the high voltage winding of our power transformer to the plates of the 5Y3 rectifier. Now this transformer has a rather unique uh, feature and that is it, it has two separate uh, high voltage outputs. The red wires will output 325 volts. The red and white wires will output 275 volts. The red and yellow wire is the center tap. Now there's something you have to keep in mind when considering the high voltage output of your power transformer. And that is the values given, in this case 325 and 275, are before rectification and smoothing. Now the rectification is inefficient and you will actually lose some voltage. But the filtration will smooth the output to the peak voltage which is 1.414 times the stated pre-rectification voltage. That means that the 325 winding will, would come out without any losses, which is unrealistic, un, uh, at around 460 volts. Now because of the inefficiency of rectification and other losses, uh, we can expect a plate voltage of around 425 being the maximum possible. For the 275 volt winding, we'll get a uh, 389 volt uh, kind of gross high voltage output, which uh, correcting for inefficiency, be around 355. Now since we're going to be using a brand new pair of 6v6's, I'm thinking we ought to run it at 425. If we were running uh, vintage 6v6's, I might want to use that uh, lower uh, value winding, but I think with these uh, output tubes, 425 should work just fine. That means that we're going to connect the solid red wires to pins 4 and pin 6 of the rectifier tube. Those are the two plates. It doesn't matter which wire goes where. There's no polarity here. It's simply uh, one red wire to 4, one red wire to 6. I coiled up the lower voltage output leads insulated the ends of the wire and then uh, put some heat shrink to double insulate and they will stay here uh, if needed or if not needed. Okay, so uh, I'm preserving those wires in case we decide to lower the plate voltage at a later date. And you see the 425 volt uh, output wires uh, twisted to neutralize their electromagnetic field and connected to pins 4 and 6 of the 5Y3 rectifier. The wiring now of the rectifier is finished uh, 
except for the one B plus wire that's going to come out here of pin 2 is going to go through the grommet and is going to go to our power supply and output transformer on that rear plate. And if you need a reference to a schematic you can see here we have pins 2 and 8 and it shows uh, the filament here and then 4 and 6 coming from the high voltage winding. That would be the red wires that would be the yellow wires. As you can see it's it's right there plain as day on the schematic. Now let's shift our attention to the 6V6 output tubes. Another great source of uh, information is a tube manual or an RCA triple pin dex like I have here that shows the internal structures within the tubes, in this case the 6V6, and the pins that are connected to each of them. Now I've created a uh, sort of a simplified version of that right here and uh, we're going to start off by wiring our filament voltage which is going to be uh, two green wires I'll show you in just a second and that'll be to pins 2 and 7. Here are the green wires that form the 6.3 volt filament circuit and here is the center tap for the uh, that circuit and by grounding this center tap we will greatly reduce the hum that can be caused by having AC run into our two bases. So let's get started. Uh, first we'll have to identify pins 2 and 7 here of our six of uh, these sixes. Now I've marked pin one and it's kind of a good idea to do that I think so that you won't make mistakes. That's pin one so there's going to be pin two then we'll go around three, four, five, six, pin seven it's going to be right here. It's exactly the same on the neighboring tube. So we need to twist these green wires tightly and make sure that they connect one of them to pin two of each of the tubes and the other to pin seven of each of the tubes and while we're at it why don't we connect them up here to our pilot light which is 6.3 volts so that when the power switch is switched on we'll know it because uh, the pilot light will come on so we're going to wire these three components right now with 6.3 volts AC well, I've got uh, the two 6V6s and the pilot light all wired uh, with the filament voltage of 6.3 volts. I moved the uh, on-off toggle switch out of the way to make things a little easier. Notice that the wires are twisted. Notice also that they uh, go up, they arch over, and come down into the center of the socket. The last thing you want is for them to wrap around or be down near other pins. This way they just sort of appear from above and uh, the field that they create will not uh, have much of an effect on the uh, other tube pins. Now to complete the 6.3 volt filament wiring I've connected twisted wires to the two terminals on the uh, pilot light then I brought, the, or brought them around here and connected them to these two terminals on this strip. I then twisted the 6.3 volt output from the power transformer and connected them so that now the 6.3 volts comes out of the transformer over here and to the pilot light and to the two 6V6s. I also with these terminals have the 6.3 volts very accessible now for the filaments of the 212AX7s. Now let's wire the grids of the 6V6s and we see that that's pin 5. Then when we look at um, our schematic we see that uh, and it's a good idea uh, there are grid blockers, 1500 ohm grid blockers between the output of the phase inverter and the grids of the two output tubes. So let's get uh, a pair of 1500 ohm resistors and solder them to pin 5. The 1500 ohm grid blockers have each been soldered 
to the number five terminal on uh, each of the 6v6 tube sockets. Uh, the other end has come over here to one of the lugs on the terminal strip uh, to be connected to the rest of the circuit when the rest of the circuit uh, has been wired. Now let's wire the screen grids and as we see the screen grids will be coming from our power rail which has yet to be constructed so what we'll do is go in here to pin 4 which is the pin associated with the screen grid and bring a wire over here to our terminal strip making it readily available to attach our B plus from the power rail once the uh, power supply is constructed on the plate that will be attached right here. I used white wires to connect a pin 4 on each tube base which is the screen grid to the terminal strip awaiting the completion of the power supply and the connection to it. Next uh, will be pin 3 or the plates of the 6V6. We see that the plates are connected to the output transformer which is not installed yet. Let's uh, connect pin 3 and bring it out here to our terminal strip so that when we install the output transformer it'll be an easy connection. Well pin 3 or the plate of the 6v6 is now connected to this terminal on the strip. Next to it we have the screen grid and the signal grid. Over here we have signal grid, screen grid, plate all that's left now is the cathode which will be pin 8 uh, that's going to be right here and in the same position on that tube and what I'll do is they will be connected together and then brought to one of the terminals and from that terminal then we will connect our bias resistor to ground and we will uh, use uh, or experiment to find the proper bias resistance to give us uh, a proper plate dissipation for our 6v6 output tube. Now the final uh, tube component, the cathodes, pin 8, of each socket is connected they're connected together and to this terminal and like I said we're going to run a bias resistor and we're going to have our switchable cathode bypass cap uh, both connect to this particular terminal. Now it's time to reinstall the power switch and to install that aluminum plate upon which we will build our power rail and attach our output transformer. Before we install that uh, power supply plate, I forgot to mention that I uh, linked the two screen grid uh, wires together because, as you see here, the screens are energized by a single wire. That way now I can bring a single wire from the power supply to either this terminal or this terminal and energize both of the screen grids. I will deal with the center taps for the 6.3 volt and high voltage windings uh, a little later. Our power supply plate now has been attached to the rear of the chassis and it's time to connect all the leads from the output transformer and to construct our power rail with our filter caps and internodal resistors. I'm now wiring the output transformer into the circuit and having brought all of the uh, tube connections up to these uh, terminal strips sure makes it a lot easier. The plate connections from the primary of the output transformer are brown and blue so I connected uh, the brown wire to one of the uh, plate wires and the blue wire over here to the other plate wire. Then the center tap from the primary is connected directly to the B plus and the B plus comes out through a red wire through the grommet 
and is going to uh, be attached to the uh, power supply rail here that we're going to construct now. Here's how it looks on the schematic. You see the three wires uh, forming the primary uh, of the output transformer. Brown wire to one plate at pin three. R blue wire down here to the other plate at pin three. The red uh, wire which is the center tap comes down here to our rail from which we will derive each of the voltages that we need for the uh, different portions of the amplification circuit. The power rail is completed. Let's check the wiring against the schematic to make sure no mistakes were made. The B plus comes in here from pin 2 of the uh, rectifier tube and we see that it goes through 30 microfarads to ground. Okay, this is the uh, point at which the B plus comes in, 30 microfarads to ground. Then we go through 1000 ohm 1 watt. In this case, it's a 1000 ohm 2 watt resistor to another 30 microfarads to ground. Okay, uh, we're right at this point here. Then we go through a 10K, they say 1 watt, I say 2 watt resistor right here, and then the final 30 microfarads to ground. Now we have nodes, we've already connected the center tap. Uh, we have this node here that will go to the screens. Then we have this node here that will power our preamp section. And they will come from right here and right here. Okay, while the Lord of the Idiots drones away across the street on his second hour of uninterrupted leaf blowing, uh, let's go ahead and fire this beast up. Now it's time to wire the screen grids. So we will find the point immediately after the 1000 ohm resistor on our power rail and connect a wire from that point to the junction of the two white wires from the screen grids which is terminal 4 on each of the 6V6 tube bases. Here are those white wires. Remember that I uh, connected them a couple steps ago. So now we will run our red wire from the point immediately after the 1000 ohm resistor down through the grommet and here is the end of it right here. Let's strip it and connect it to this terminal so that it can carry uh, our B plus to the screens of our 6v6s. And now our screens are connected to the power rail. Now the B plus continues down the power rail through a 10,000 ohm resistor to provide plate voltage to the phase inverter and to the two triodes used for preamplification. We see here the 10,000 ohm resistor, so we'll be going to this lug down through our a grommet through the grommet over here to this terminal 
on the terminal strip between the two 12AX7s so that the plate voltage can be distributed to each of the triodes. And there goes the B plus to energize the plates of the two 12AX7s. Now it's time to finish wiring the output transformer by connecting the secondary wires to the speaker output jack. The green wire goes to the output leaf. The black wire goes to the grounding lug and to the middle leaf here, the one that touches the big output leaf whenever nothing's plugged in. To that uh, terminal we will connect our 10 watt 8 ohm emergency ballast load. The speaker output jack is now wired. The 8 ohm output from the secondary, the output transformer, is going to this lug which contacts the tall main output leaf. The right hand lug here is the grounded lug, grounded through the body of the jack and the yellow wire goes to the middle lug which is connected to the shorter contact leaf back here that is only in contact with the output leaf if nothing, uh, no jack is plugged in. So uh, in this position the output from the secondary of the output transformer has 8 ohms and 10 watts of resistance to ground. I'm using the ground over here for the uh, tremolo foot switch. Okay, so um, that should provide safety in case the amp is ever turned on without a speaker attached. And to make sure that those three wires are kept out of harm's way, I put in a, a cable retainer that will hold them in to the confines of the chassis. I changed switches for the cathode bypass cap and the NFB loop. Let me show you how I wired them both. If you look down here you'll see a wire from the cathodes of the 6V6's. Remember they're linked together by the black wire going here to the central lug of the switch and then uh, for the left hand lug I have a 25 microfarad at 50 volt um, electrolytic capacitor coming over here to this terminal. Uh, I haven't finished wiring it yet so I've just connected it to the, to the terminal and have not soldered. So now when this switch is in the on position uh, the 6V6's will have a cathode bypass capacitor. In this position they will not. Now for the switchable NFB loop. The NFB loop originally came from the positive lug of the speaker output jack to a 56K resistor and I ran it up through the switch and back to this terminal. Eventually we'll connect the NFB loop with the cathode of the second triode uh, amplification stage of the amplifier. You see here is the NFB loop through 56K over to the uh, hot lead to the speaker. So I have simply duplicated this. I have not connected it yet because I haven't wired this uh, triode but uh, I've made it switchable. I have a switch in here that when it's in this position you have no NFB loop. When it's in this position toward the on you do have an NFB loop. I think um, this demonstrates the value of these uh, terminal strips in that you can break down your wire runs. You don't just have a whole 
a pile of spaghetti here of wires all tangled up going from one spot to another. They follow a very logical path. They stop. They're stabilized by the terminal strip. They continue. Uh, you can turn this thing up down, and, uh, upside down and shake it and the wires are not going to move. So um, really I'm a firm believer in point-to-point -point wiring with terminal strips. So now the entire right hand portion of the circuit is finished uh, except for the provision of that isolated ground that I discussed earlier for the high voltage uh, circuit and I think it's time we construct that now so that we can start grounding our electrolytic capacitors our cathode bypass cap and uh, the uh, center taps for the 6.3 volt winding and for the high voltage and uh, all the other components that are yet to be uh, installed on the chassis. To do this I will use this terminal strip and I'm going to use the end terminal strictly to attach the strip uh, using the nut and bolt from the output transformer. This lug will not be used because it's in contact with the chassis. These uh, six lugs will be isolated from the chassis and therefore they will be the ones we will use for isolated grounding. Next we'll solder a wire that connects all six of the isolated terminals together. Next I have connected all of the negative grounded ends of the electrolytic filter caps to my ground bus. I've also connected the bias resistor for the 6V6s and the cathode bypass cap from the 6V6s as well as the center tap from the high voltage winding. So from this point forward no component or wire will be grounded to the chassis. All of the grounds will come to this bus and be connected to the center tap of the high voltage winding of the power transformer and that's that red wire with the yellow tracer. The only two wires that will be connected to the chassis will be the uh, center tap for the uh, 6.3 volt filament winding and the green grounding uh, wire from the three wire power cord and they will be connected to the chassis through uh, zinc plated hardware with lock washers to ensure that they will not come loose. Well I think that about does it for this part two video in our series on the uh, scratch building of Uncle Doug's Sue Princeton amplifier. I hope you enjoyed our little breaks from the workshop Every once in a while it's nice to get out and get a little fresh air. In part three, which should be out in two or three weeks, uh, we will complete the wiring of the amp, insert the tubes, and then test it. Uh, I hope you stay tuned for that. Um, I think it's going to be exciting and I know the fire department is on speed dial so we should be fairly safe. I'd like to take a moment to thank our PayPal contributors and our Patreon patrons for their generous support of our channel for another month keeping us on the air and advertising free. Without this support I seriously doubt if we'd still be making videos. If you'd like to join them in supporting our channel I will put links in the video description which will enable you to do so. So until we meet again in part three thanks so much for watching uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so, and by all means stay tuned because the best is yet to come. Bye for now.